A walk through the grounds of the University of Virginia leaves the impression that no detail escapes the impact of Thomas Jefferson. The ever-present octagonal designs, central core, symmetrical wings, classical orders and moldings, serpentine wall, red bricks, white columns, Chinese railings, suppressed stairs. It's all there. At the University of Virginia, nothing escapes the shadow of its maker. Not until the occasional visitor finds him or herself before Monroe Hill. The eclectic L-shaped compound. The white elephant on grounds. To the north, a Georgian mansion. Next to the mansion, the colonnade dorms, still bearing the signatures of residents who lived through the fervor of the Spanish-American War. Further south, the 1790s law office of James Monroe. The jewel predates the laying of the cornerstone at the university and has been patiently waiting on the hill to share the untold story of James Monroe's first farm in Albemarle County, cradle of the University of Virginia. James Monroe get to Charlottesville. The standard story is that uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, encouraged James Monroe to come to Charlottesville so he could be part of a community of, of like-minded men who would um, help begin the uh, United States on a way to fulfill its potential. And undoubtedly that is true. But what was the proximate reason, perhaps, of Jefferson wanting Monroe to come? particularly at the time he trades the property with uh, George Nicholas that Monroe had in Kentucky, which you got as uh, land grants for service the Revolutionary War, for land that Nicholas had here uh, just outside of Charlottesville. Why would Monroe make that trade then? It's interesting to realize that amongst uh, prominent founding figures from Virginia, James Monroe was the only one who did not actively support the ratification of the Constitution. This very much dismayed Thomas Jefferson, also dismayed James Madison, two men who Monroe was creating a, a very strong friendship. And it's my um, speculation, perhaps, deduction, 
that one of the additional reasons that Jefferson wanted Monroe to come to Charlottesville and be near him as a neighbor was to rescue him from sort of going off to the side and becoming a political outsider and to sort of get him into closer control because he liked so much about Monroe's other abilities, both as a person and as a writer and as a politician. And he felt if Monroe remained on his own in Fredericksburg, uh, he would have potentially lost him to the uh, elements within society who did not perceive the need for a vigorous and uh, effective central government. Monroe, during his lifetime, certainly during his presidency, was acknowledged, recognized, honored as being a, a, a not just a wounded veteran, but wounded during the, the Revolutionary War. Um, you know, when he was on his tours, it was raised again and again, and you know, the newspapers had you know, references to Monroe shedding his blood in, in the cause of American liberty and freedom and, and, and so on. And this went back you know, well before his presidency. In fact, uh, John Trumbull, the famous American painter, did a series of paintings, uh, most famously the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Washington resigning his commission, but he did one also of the at Washington at Trenton. And one of the figures in the painting is a wounded James Monroe. This was painted in 1796 when um, it was begun in, in, earlier when Monroe was in the Senate, but, but the painting was finished you know, during this period we're talking about when Monroe uh, resided at um, Monroe Hill when he was a, um, when, 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 when he was a senator, when he was minister to France. And so through his lifetime, this was certainly an attribute, I guess you call it an attribute, of, 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 of who he was. It was certainly part of his public persona. When James Monroe first moved to the area in 1789, purchased the property, it was a very rural community, agriculturally centered. Um, there's an interesting and very uh, detailed description of what Albemarle County looked like in the late 1770s, a decade before Monroe moved uh, to Monroe Hill. Um, it was given by a British officer who was a prisoner here. describe the area uh, as uh, scattered small homesteads and farms. Uh, he gives a very astute description of the way the residences looked and how the farms and plantations were managed. The plantations are scattered here and there over the land which is thickly covered with timber. On these, there is a dwelling house with kitchen and smokehouse and other outhouses detached. And from the various buildings, each plantation has the appearance of a small village. At some little distance from the houses are peach and apple orchards, and scattered over the plantations are the Negroes' huts and tobacco barns, which are large and built of wood for the cure of that article. Most of the planters consign the care of their plantations and Negroes to an overseer. Even the man whose house we rent has his overseer, though he could with ease superintend it himself. But if they possess a few Negroes, they think it beneath their dignity. The whole management of the plantation is left to the overseer, who, as an encouragement to make the most of the crops, gets a certain portion as his wages. This is uh, late summer here at James Monroe's birthplace in Westmoreland County, Virginia. We're a little bit east of the home site, uh, standing in woods. Uh, certainly these woods would not have existed at the time of Monroe's childhood uh, because the trees would have been cut down and this would have been farmland. The standard historical narrative 
says that James Monroe sought and purchased land near Charlottesville in order to gain the rank and stature of Virginia gentlemen. This really isn't that persuasive because since the 1650s, Monroe's family owned land here in Westmoreland County. And he inherited that land from his father. This is something he already had. He had the, the basics of a Virginia gentleman. What he instead sought in Charlottesville was more productive land, a land that could help him be part of a emerging American economy, would give him produce, things to sell, something he could do to be a leader, to be a productive person in this emerging new country. Additional factors certainly contributed to Monroe's landing in Charlottesville. For instance, the flow of westward expansion. Monroe was not alone in the business of settling west, and by 1790, Albemarle County reported a population of almost 13,000. Charlottesville, the county seat, consisted of 45 houses, a tavern, a courthouse, and a jail. The American experiment was underway, and Charlottesville was fast becoming a promising rural community, as a new class of landowners was emerging from the shadows of the colonial past. James Monroe represents this new class of yeoman planters whose priorities and expectations focused on continued financial success and the success of the American experiment. Good morning, Charlottesville. It's 8 a.m. and you're listening to Monroe Hill News, Versailles. Intoxicated with liberty, a mob of enthusiastic Parisians stormed the medieval fortress of La Bastille, hoping to get their hands on badly needed gunpowder for the nearly 30,000 muskets captured during an earlier raid on the Hotel des Invalides. The French Revolution is about to dethrone the monarchy, while the rest of Europe shows growing concern for the Republican ideals. New York. George Washington, former leader of the Continental Army and chairman of the Continental Congress, has been unanimously elected as the first president of the United States. In his first State of the Union speech, Washington presented topics related to defense, foreign policy, economics, education, and immigration. A nation is born, and in America, these are the very first of times. It's 8.01, and you're listening to Monroe Hill News. One of the important things to remember about the United States government at its founding is that it wasn't a permanent establishment. So the senators were not in Philadelphia convening throughout the year. They were up for um, a few months at a time, and then they would have long stretches where they could go back home. And they had good reason to go back home, because many of them were farmers, or even if they were lawyers, they had to address their needs of their home, their property, and their families. Now, in Monroe's case, besides taking care of his farm here on Monroe Hill and his immediate family, he had his younger siblings, who he always had to take care of, and they were in the, the Charlottesville area. And um, he was able to look after them. And they, they were a challenge because they never really found um, their own firm footing in, in either marriages or economic circumstances, and they always were a point of concern. In fact, Monroe bought at least four other plantations in Virginia. The first in Kings George County, close to his ancestral Westmoreland. Highland, the farm neighboring Jefferson's Monticello. Oak Hill in Loudoun County, where Monroe lived before moving with his youngest daughter to New York, where he died in July 4, 1831. And Limestone Plantation. According to some, his brother Andrew lived and died in Limestone and is presumably buried in the nearby graveyard. We set out to explore this site. Unfortunately, we're offered not easy access. 
Monroe's youngest brother, Joseph, occasionally worked as an unreliable overseer. He's said to have been a serious liability to James and everyone else. Eventually, Joseph would move to Missouri, where he died on July 1824. A walk through the ruins of limestone helped us draw a more accurate picture of what the law office on Monroe Hill might have been like. The surviving structure still transpires a feeling for the vernacular that helped shape the nation in the post-revolutionary era. Monroe Hill, James Monroe First Farm in Albemarle County, represents a moment in time when the colony ceased to be in search for its unique cultural and political identity, a distinctive American character. James Monroe didn't have a Camelot, or more appropriately, he didn't have a Monticello, or a Mount Vernon, or a Mount Pelier. He was always looking for that, and I think that as he progressed uh, in his career, as he attempted to achieve the ideal of the Virginia gentleman that he wanted to be, he kept getting interrupted along that path. He, he would answer calls to government service. He would find himself overextended financially. And whether it was Monroe Hill or Highland uh, or, or even eventually Oak Hill, he could never quite get the timing or the combination of resources just right. He probably came closest to his ideal with Oak Hill, but it came too late in life. So I think the story of James Monroe and, and his defining of himself had a lot to do with the kind of home, the kind of estate that he was looking for. Monroe Hill represented his first real effort at that there would be others to come, and he never quite got it the way he wanted it. So the 1790s were a period of extraordinary construction, uh, and that's a result of a profound uh, pent-up demand that, had, uh, that was the result of the American Revolution. Uh, so in the midst of significant uh, transatlantic and cross-continental conflict, there was very little building construction happening in what would become the United States uh, in the 1770s and 1780s. Um, there's also significant financial vacillation, uncertainty of uh, currency uh, through the 80s and into the early 90s. And uh, that context meant that not too many people were building. Yet, people continued to have babies, uh, families continued to grow, and um, uh, particularly after the establishment of the new nation, immigration uh, is uh, beginning to experience an uptick. So by the 1790s, there's a significant demand for new construction, um, uh, particularly in territories uh, such as Albemarle County, where there's available land. So individuals like Monroe, who have some financial capacity, move from the East Coast into this territory, and they bring with them a new architectural vocabulary. And that architectural vocabulary is substantial masonry construction that accomplishes a number of things. One, it conveys the conviction of the permanence of the new nation. So there's a degree of, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, um, assurance that the United States, in fact, is uh, going to have some longevity. And so the construction in brick architecture uh, conveys a, a capacity for um, the new nation uh, and a vision that the new nation, in fact, is going to make it. The cluster of buildings that makes up Monroe Hill 
provides a very interesting history of the university. Because there you have the original law office, then you have Perry's house, which was remodeled, and then you have the addition in 1848 of the wings that connected all of this together. And there probably were some other buildings up there that have disappeared over the years. But what it does show in a certain sense is that this is the way that the university evolved. And of course, the addition of those wings in 1848 was to provide housing for Virginia students. And so it was carrying on the tradition that started at the very beginning, but now is being carried outside of the Jefferson precinct to a new spot. We know of a few insurance reports or um, policies that Monroe took out on the property of Monroe Hill that kind of give vague descriptions of at least the buildings he insured. So I believe the insurance policy of 1800 has three known buildings, uh, two equal sized brick building, one of which we believe is the law office behind me, and uh, a third building which is a framed uh, probably winter kitchen or exterior kitchen, which is uh, typical of Virginia in this time. Uh, we also have some of Monroe's letters, uh, particularly those while he is in France uh, acting as minister uh, and writing back and forth to, to relatives and friends in Virginia about his plantation and taking care of uh, mundane tasks from planting orchards to uh, whether additions should be made to the house. Just when Monroe was getting himself and his family settled here in Charlottesville, he also was angling to um, get himself elected senator from Virginia to the new continental, to the new United States Congress formed after the ratification. He had been disappointed in losing a uh, competition for House of Representatives to his good friend James Madison, uh, but he still was very interested in playing a role in the, the new. Uh, federal government. And so after a couple of unsuccessful attempts, he did receive the nomination from the Virginia legislature in 1790, uh, toward the end of the year. And in order to make it for the beginning of the new session, he had to hurry from Virginia to Philadelphia. And he was uh, sworn in immediately upon his arrival in uh, late December of uh, 1790. Now it's really interesting that when he gets to Philadelphia, he uh, has to get his wife settled and his daughter, and one of the things he does there is uh, get smallpox inoculation for both of them. So he doesn't want them to die from that uh, killer of the late 18th century. But he does write back his um, initial impressions of Philadelphia, which are very unfavorable. He called the city's um, he disparaged the city for its noise, its extravagance, and dissipation, which shows that besides being close to Jefferson and having land, he liked small town or rural life. 
and Philadelphia was just the opposite. So if the government were not there, there's really no reason to think that Monroe was going to want to live permanently in one of the uh, late 18th century cities. The Monroe Hill property is, uh, in my opinion, a linchpin to the history of the University of Virginia. Uh, the James Monroe property was established and developed uh, before the university, but the history of uh, the hilltop and the larger area goes back several thousands of years to Native American occupation. Uh, and in this way, that Monroe Hill, Monroe Hill history is a layered approach to finding out more about the physical development of the property and a larger and more significant context. One of the things that we are constantly discovering about the university is that there are these hidden layers of history, or there is parts of history that we have paid no attention to, such as who were the workers here, uh, who were the enslaved that worked on this, as well as the free whites. But also should be really recognized is that there were other buildings that were really crucial to the history of this, and to really effectively tell the history of the university, we need to put the law office in this and put together a connection here that shows how this place came into being. When we were living in Monroe Hill House in the 1990s, there was a, an archeological dig done to see what artifacts they could find from the history. And we sort of watched this from the back porch, which was really fun. And do you remember some of the things that they found? Well, I think they found a doll's head. Uh, they found a broken pottery. Uh, well, I guess we learned from that experience that a uh, hundred years ago, people didn't have trash pickup. And of course, they didn't produce as much trash as we do. Packaging has, has overtaken whatever's in the package. But when, you, when something was broken, <coughs> it got thrown out. And very often, if it was small enough, it got thrown in the privy. Uh, well, a privy turns out then to be a very rich <laughs> archaeological site. It's still the case. <laughs> right. It's where one puts refuse. So when they were putting in the elevator, which was right where the, one of the privies was, uh, Ben Ford, the archaeologist, I think, found all kinds of interesting things there are buttons, broken buttons, broken buckles. Uh, One man's trash, another man's treasure. Right. An archaeologist's right. treasure, anyway. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, the university sponsored some archaeological research at Monroe Hill, uh, wanting to find out more about the history of the university occupation there. Um, and so I was hired to teach a summer field school with uh, the university students and we were engaged in both uh, larger shovel testing of the property and focused excavation in large units. And uh, in the rear of the Monroe Hill property uh, we identified uh, areas that possessed intact uh, cultural deposits, uh, artifact bearing soils uh, dating to the first half of the 19th century. If, if we had the opportunity to go back as archaeologists and uh, excavate some of the larger Monroe Hill property, uh, we would anticipate uh, finding intact cultural deposits, hopefully some structures, some outbuildings, and buried uh, cultural features, uh, certainly associated with the university occupation of the property, but also predating the university. Uh, one of the things that archaeology is good at doing is telling stories about uh, people who aren't uh, readily represented in the documentary record. Monroe is drawn here by his two friends, and Monroe Hill is also an important but a more struggling enterprise for him. At one point he writes a letter to Madison saying, I would so much love for you to come visit me because I have some questions about both agriculture and architecture and I really need uh, some assistance in the former agriculture. So he moved here but he was looking for that support from his two friends who had at that time prosperous, robust plantations 
all three of them by the end of their lifetime would run into trouble with their plantations and their finances. Hey, one of the, the, the great challenge for farming in, um, in the United States in the late 18th century was the labor issue. And so in order to have uh, a working farm of any scale that got beyond a subsistence farm that just took care of a family, you need to have a labor force. And so you know, what was really driving a lot of the slave owners was a sense that slavery was an economical and efficient way to maintain a labor force to run large-scale agricultural operation. And um, in the South, where, where you had large-scale labor-intensive crops, uh, initially tobacco, and then even when you went into wheat, you know, where you needed the various forms of treatment and a large number of people for harvest, it made economic sense to have a slave force. Getting over the economic hurdle was one of the significant problems that uh, the abolition of slavery faced as an intellectual concern. James Monroe was a lifelong slave owner, uh, which is a difficult um, position and um, it's hard to not view it anachronistically. Um, it's hard for us not to bring our understanding of human rights into the conversation. But he did own slaves. He owned slaves from his teenage years on. Um, one of the names we see associated with the Monroe Hill era is that of Tenia or Thenia, sometimes written as Tina Hemmings. From the correspondence between James Monroe and his uncle Joseph Jones, we learned about Thenia, Sally Hemming's older sister, who was sold to James Monroe along with her daughters, Betsy, Lucy, Mary, Sally, and Susan. From the correspondence, we can also conclude that Thenia's partner was a man named Peter, and that the two held a place of relevance amongst the slaves of Monroe Hill. We also learned that Thenia died on the hill a year after giving birth in the winter of 1795. And we believe that she was buried somewhere on the property, possibly in the African American Cemetery, recently unveiled at the University of Virginia, within the boundaries of what used to be Monroe's property. A history of Monroe Hill would be incomplete without drawing on the enslaved population. However, representing slavery is a challenge. We have limited assets, just a few prints and images that have been exploited to the point in which they've become generic, interchangeable. Thenia and Peter are faceless, the children are faceless, and the problem of representing slavery on Monroe Hill and elsewhere remains a challenge, one we opted to face with the help of a group of UVA students on their way to the Library of Virginia in search for records and clues that could perhaps someday help us interpret the faceless universe of a handful of first names, dashes, numbers, crosses, and suppositions. Bilateral relations with the revolutionary government of France. President Washington has announced the immediate recall from Paris of Minister Governor Morris and the appointment of Senator James Monroe from Virginia as his replacement. Senator Monroe has started preparations for the month long journey and will be traveling with his wife and daughter. They are expected to arrive at the French port of Le Havre by the end of July. Monroe arrived in, in France, uh, went to Paris, arrived in Paris at really the height of the Reign of Terror. In fact, he got, he, he, they, they, they arrived in Paris a week after Robespierre himself was, was executed. <laughs> In 
In Paris, Monroe walked a fine line between the urgency of ministerial affairs in a country at war and the domestic and mundane administration of his farm across the pond. 6,320 kilometers due west, a plantation that he now considers too small, unsuited for the current circumstances. Monroe was eager to sell the farm at any price, yet the hill would prove to be a hard sale. In Paris, Monroe found comfort in La Folie Bougier, an elegant residence on Rue de Clichy with an outstanding view of Sacre Coeur. The Petite Mansion served as a safe haven for Thomas Paine, spared from the guillotine by the minister's diplomatic efforts. While a guest of the ambassador, Paine wrote the second part of The Age of Reason, as well as several letters denouncing George Washington's policy. La Folie Bougier was also a temporary refuge to Republicans fleeing persecution in Great Britain. Facilitating the contact between Irish revolutionary elements such as Wolf Tone and the French government. These connections would ultimately lead to three consecutive invasions across the channel. Monroe regarded the American allegiance to England as a betrayal of Republican principles. And President Washington was beginning to acknowledge Monroe as a royal pain in Paris. However, Monroe pleased the administration when, with the complicity of his wife, Elizabeth Courtright, he was able to secure the release from guillotine row of Adrienne de Lafayette, wife of the Marquis, and longtime friend of the American Revolution. The deed brought relief to Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and score of Lafayette's friends in America. Still, at the end of the day, Monroe's presence in Paris was increasingly difficult to deal with, and the president recalled his minister. La Folie Bougier did not survive the times, and Paris has no records of Monroe having lived there. The Berlioz Square, where the statue to the French composer stands today where the mansion used to be. And since the Monroes moved back to Charlottesville, Montmartre seems to have lost the suburban charm of post-revolutionary France. Monroe knew for quite a while that he was out of sympathy with the goals of the Washington administration, was expecting to be recalled, and in the summer of 1796 was notified that he was going to be replaced and that, that he, sh he would be returning to the United States. It was coming on the winter. You didn't want to cross the Atlantic at that time in a wooden sailing ship in, in, in the middle of the stormy season. So he spent some time. He traveled to the Netherlands then in the spring. He went to Bordeaux with his family. They got a ship back to the United States where they arrived in Philadelphia in June. Monroe kept things going between the U.S. and France for about two years when he was there. The French weren't happy with the United States. They wanted to break off relations. Monroe prevented it. When Monroe left, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney arrived as the U.S. minister. The French received, refused to receive him. So basically, when Monroe left, France severed relations with the United States. And the Federalists were all saying, this is Monroe's fault. He was a terrible minister. He did an awful job, and that's why. You read all this stuff about Monroe's return, and it's Monroe returned in disgrace from France. Well, he arrives, the ship sails up to the dock. Jefferson, Madison, Albert Gallatin were waiting on the dock for him. When Monroe returned to the United States in June of 1796, he was eager to get back to Monroe Hill to address his farm and his family concerns. But that did not come about. When he went into New York in July of 1797, he was confronted by Alexander Hamilton, who charged Monroe with leaking to the press details of a sordid affair known as the Reynolds Affair. That was an episode involving public speculation, blackmail, and sexual improprieties. When uh, Monroe received a demand from Hamilton to submit a retraction, Monroe balked at that. 
This led to a lot of animosity between the two men that was not sorted out until January. And at different points, they came very near having a duel. Even after Monroe got back to Monroe Hill in Virginia, he determined that his public reputation really needed to be restored. And he decided, with the advice of Jefferson and Madison, to write a formal um, defense of his actions as a French minister. And uh, this was done, and he titled it A View on the Conduct of the Executive, and it was a full-scale attack on Washington's foreign policy. When it was published in December, Washington and friends of Washington, who was a large number of people, took great offense, and it caused a permanent breach between the two men. He was, of course, eager to get back home to Virginia, to get back to his farm, to get back to taking care of his personal affairs, to get that part of his life going again. But there were other things to do. And it was almost a year before he could eventually get back home. Finally packed up, left Philadelphia, and, and headed back to his farm in Virginia and tried to get, assuming he was returning to private life and he could now devote all of his attention to taking care of his farms and, and his private affairs. Monroe's fortunes picked up in December of 1799 when he was elected governor of Virginia with the assistance of his friend James Madison. Um, also in that month, he was finally able to move his family from Monroe Hill into his new home at Highland. In May of that year, his son Spence was born, continuing the tradition of naming children after the family, Spence being the name of his father. But just as quickly as things went well, they went off track and sorely tried Monroe's optimism and his view of an expansive nation guided by reason and fueled by liberty. Shortly after their return to Virginia, um, Elizabeth Monroe gave birth to their second child, a son named James Monroe Spence, and the Monroes were ecstatic. The baby was robust for about the first six, eight months, and then started developing childhood illnesses as children did and do. Elizabeth took the baby, took the children, went back up to the farm in Albemarle County, spent time with the Madisons at Montpelier, living just away from, from Richmond, hoping that the child would recover. So Monroe writes to his friend James Madison, an unhappy event has occurred which has overwhelmed us with grief. At 10 last night, our beloved babe departed this life after several days sickness, which attended the cutting his eye teeth in the last stage when we flattered ourselves the danger had passed. I cannot give you an idea of the effect this event has produced on my family or of my own affliction in being a partner and spectator of this scene. Many things have roused me beyond what I thought was possible. Knowing the interest you take in our welfare, I perform a painful task in communicating to you and family this great calamity. Constitution for the new Republic of Haiti. The new Constitution establishes the first sovereign black state and confirms that he, General Louverture, will rule for life. Thirteen years after placing Monroe Hill on the market, the property was now being sold to accommodate the need of a growing demographics. 
Albemarle's population had almost folded. Cash was king. And the liquidation of Monroe Hill was a dance of sorts, a game of musical chairs. From Monroe to Lewis, from Lewis to Catlett, the farmer who supplied Thomas Jefferson with butter. From Catlett to Divers, a friend of Jefferson who already owned the property we know today as Farmington, from Divers to John Nicholas, and from John Nicholas to John Perry, who sold the 40 acres where the University of Virginia was to be founded. The transaction found Monroe, a member of the commission that included Madison and Jefferson, in the buying end of the bargain, gaining the old farm on the hill all over again. Almost 30 years after he first established his home at Monroe Hill, James Monroe had an opportunity to come back, this time as President of the United States. And it was a significant opportunity to help found an important new educational institution. For James Monroe, the events on October 6th, 1817, the laying of the cornerstone of the university, must have been a very moving, indeed a very poignant event for him. Because here he was, the President of the United States, also a member of the Board of Visitors of the University of Virginia, and had been one of the individuals involved in the creation of the university from the very beginning. And so here he comes out to this poor, turned out old field where they have begun to lay out the university. And as he lays the cornerstone, which is a perfect square, he would have looked up and looked over and there was his house off slightly in the distance. And of course, here was a connection. This is a place that he'd lived. And now this is becoming the University of Virginia, an idea that had been in motion for many years, going back to the Revolutionary War, when Jefferson suggested that there ought to be a state-sponsored education, and that now, finally, a university is being created. And so, for him, it must have been that to look off and to see his house, his red brick house, his little law office sitting up there on top of the hill, would be a rather moving experience. It's been told countless times, in a myriad of ways. The cornerstone was laid at the University of Virginia on October 6, 1817. At the time, there were no obstructions, trees, or serpentine walls. And President Monroe probably had a clear view of the house that had been his castle on the hill, his first home in a nation that was beginning to get used to the idea of first times. The window above the law office was a reminder of a time almost 30 years earlier when no seed would bear fruit to compensate his labors. Perhaps because of that, we'd like to think that on that day, the cornerstone was a means of getting even. Monroe, the public servant, was finally coming to terms with Monroe, the farmer, and the land he thought useless was giving one more opportunity. No tobacco or wheat this time. No sunflower, corn, or potatoes. The cornerstone seed being planted was the promise of public education, a crop that would forever change the American equation. So the, the annual report of the Board of Visitors of the University of Virginia uh, has a proctor's report from March of 1819, which describes the property which the university is about to receive and assesses its value. Upon the 48 and 3 quarter acre tract is a dwelling house, 27 by 20, with a shed 17 by 27 feet, all of brick, with a cellar under the hole four rooms and an entry on the first floor, and two rooms upstairs. 
one other house of brick, 27 by 20 feet, with a cellar, one room, and entry on the first floor, and three rooms above the stairs. 88 feet distance from the other house, one framed kitchen, 30 by 18, two rooms, a fireplace to each, and brick chimney. One smoke house, 12 by 12 feet, framed of wood, one ice house, circular, 15 feet in diameter, and about 15 feet deep, 90 feet distance from the dwelling house, one well, 65 feet deep, with a small framed house over it, five and a half by six feet, with a windlass and chain, one Negro quarter, 32 by 16, two rooms and stone chimney in the middle, garden, 510 feet by 100 feet, paled 410 feet only. So a very detailed description uh, of the property they were receiving, and this would have been the property that was directly transferred from John Perry to the University of Virginia. And it would have been very close, I believe, to what Monroe would have occupied in 1789 uh, and what he built there, and also what would have transferred to subsequent owner, owners after he sold the property in the early 1800s. Can you give me a clap now? There you go. Thank you, and cut.